The second neighbor called his insurance company and they told him that he would be covered because he was in good hands with all state. Well, the first neighbor went crying to the second neighbor about his bad insurance company. However, he said to his friend, although I am sorry for your loss, I tried to warn you that my insurance company was better than yours. As time went on, both men died and on the same day and stood before God for judgment. St. Peter met the two men outside the pearly gates. He said to the neighbor that was a Christian that he could come into heaven because his life was in good hands. His hand, life was in the hands of Jesus. When he came to the neighbor who had been an atheist, St. Peter told him his admission was denied because he had placed his life in the wrong hands, in his own. But the second neighbor started arguing with St. Peter, just as he did with his neighbor all those years. The man said, I am really not an atheist. I only said that because me and my neighbor uh, that you let in had a friendly competition going on all those years. Just to antagonize him, I would always disagree with him. In fact, when I was a kid, I used to go to church all the time. While I even went to Sunday school and even sang in the youth choir, surely all those good deeds ought to count for something, shouldn't they? St. Peter looked at the man with a stern look on his face and responded, although you obviously did some religious stuff as a child, but as, at no time in your life did you ever take Jesus serious and want him as your saving Lord. Even when your Christian friend and neighbor on many occasions tried to tell you about Jesus, you didn't want to hear it and you stuck to your man-made religion. You live your life on your own terms and you place your faith as well as your priorities in the wrong hands, not in God's hands. As a result, no matter how sorry you might feel right now and no matter how many tears you shed, now is, is too late because heaven is not for you. How would you like to be told that story? Because you did some religious things. You live your life minding your own business on your own terms and you get to that great day of judgment and find out you had placed your faith in the wrong hands. Amen. As we turn our attention to the text today, there's two scriptures we want to tie together this morning in Isaiah 53 and the other is Matthew chapter 27. And so I'll give you a bit of background on Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah prophesied 700 years before the birth of Christ. But what he prophesied was so relevant during the time that Christ walked the earth. But he gives us a snapshot in time of a prophecy that he talked about Jesus the Christ. Isaiah the prophet wrote about more about Jesus than any of the other prophets in the Old Testament. Here's what he says in Isaiah 53, verse 1. He says, who has believed our report? The report means revelation, report good news about God. And to whom is the arm or the strength of the Lord been uh, revealed? In other words, the power of God in action, help and strength. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, which means he's coming out of the line of David, as a root out of a dry ground, which means a barren or dry, unfertile land, which means, spiritually speaking, he had no stately form of majesty. He did, in other words, he did not look the part of royalty. When Jesus walked this earth, he was just an ordinary man in appearance, even though he was God Almighty. There was nothing elaborate about him. He didn't look the part of a king. He was so ordinary that he blended in with the crowd. Amen. And when we shall see him, there was no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't a very attractive man physically, according to the text. Verse 3 says he is despised, seen as despicable or disgraceful, and rejected of men. In other words, deliberately abandoned. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we, did, we hid, as, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did not esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted which means humiliate and oppress. That famous verse, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Amen. You missed your chance to shout right there. By his stripes we're healed. That word, that, that word that's used, that Hebrew word is rafa 
which means Jehovah Rapha. That means he's our healer. He's not talking about physical healing in this text. Not here. He's talking about spiritual healing. The whipping that he took on Calvary. Everything that he took because of Calvary was for my benefit and your benefit. Amen. He says all we are like sheep who have gone astray, which means we wandered off to stumble, abandoned. We have turned every one of us to his own way, journey, path. And the Lord, meaning God the Father, had laid upon him, Jesus' son, to suffer the weight of the entire world, past, present, and future, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. In other words, he didn't make a defense on his own behalf. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep that is silent before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison from, uh, and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? And he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people who is stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. In verse 10, yet, get this, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Amen. He had put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Amen. 700 years before Jesus arrived on the scene, that's what the prophet Isaiah wrote about our Savior. Amen. Amen? And we know that in the New Testament, the story of Jesus' birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension is covered in all four Gospels. Amen? The reason why this is important because Easter is not a holiday the way we see it in the American sense or national sense. Easter is Transformation Day. Amen? Resurrection Day is transformative. Amen? If you allow it to be. If not, it's just another day. It's just another day you get off, maybe from work, maybe from school. Amen? Because on Good Friday, what we refer to as Good Friday, which was this past Friday, Jesus thought what was called, early in that week, was called the Passion Week. And the Bible describes everything that he went through as he's heading toward Calvary. Amen? And so here's the question I have for you based on Matthew chapter 27. We've been doing this series on God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love for us. And we've just been walking the text. And taking a look at just how good God is to us. Amen? Amen. He's amazing because he's God all by himself. Besides him, there is no other. Amen. It's unconditional because God loves us is not based on a condition. God loves us whether or not we accept him or not. Amen. His love is unconditional, but his blessings are very conditional. Amen. And experiencing that love is conditional based on us accepting Christ as our saving Lord. So God amazing, unconditional, undeserving. What makes it undeserving? Because none of us deserve salvation. Amen. If Jesus never went to Calvary, he'd still be God. He'd still be faithful. He'd still be just. Because God owes it to no man to save him. Amen. We all deserve hell. Because we're all born sinners. We all sin. None of us get it right. We all get things wrong. Amen. But because of what he did on Calvary, he gave us an opportunity to get our lives right with him. So again, what evidence does Matthew teach us that proves God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love for us? Well, number one, Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. I know this old cliche, you hear it a lot in the church, but it's 100% on the money as far as being truth. In verse 33 through 37, it reads this. And when they had came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Gal Galgotha is an Aramaic word, which means skull. Place of the skull, the Latin word for skull is Calvaria, which we get our English word Calvary. 
Amen. They gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. Wine mixed with gall meant to mitigate the pain. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. Crucified him. Jesus predicted the manner of his death back in Matthew 20 and 19. They divided up his clothes among themselves, which is parallel to Psalm 22 and verse 18. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him. And above his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. The placard identified the charge against Jesus, declaring him a messianic pretender and a political threat to Rome. Ironic, the sign proclaimed Jesus' true identity. The charge was written in Aramaic, Latin, and in Greek. It just wasn't written in one language. And the reason why it was done that way, because Rome wanted to send a message. Amen? Warning anyone who would dare to rebel against Rome. Now, you got to understand something. Everything about Jesus' trial is illegal. As a Roman citizen, everything that was done to him, being arrested at night, being charged with no real charges against him, everything about his trial was illegal. But God allowed the trial to, to take place to commence because it was God's plan of redemption for us. Amen? And so once again, what evidence does Matthew teach us that proves God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love for us is Jesus paid the debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. As a result, Jesus voluntarily allowed himself to be led to his death. They did not take Jesus' life. He willingly gave up his life. You got to understand that. Amen? But you also have to understand as Jesus is being led to, to Calvary, what Calvary, where they nailed him to the cross at was actually the city dump. It was actually a place that you didn't hang out. But you also have to understand that because the Sabbath was coming. Now, Sabbath is Saturday. You got to remember that. Good Friday was Friday. The Sabbath is Saturday. The first day of the week is Sunday. All right. You got to get those details straight if you want to understand the text. Amen. And so here Jesus is. Uh, what Isaiah tells us is that Jesus has been beat so bad he's unrecognizable. That's the part you miss. That was just a physical whipping he took. Do you know as, they, as, he, as, he, as he went along carrying the cross, you realize they pull out his beard? They just yanked his face. What would come out if somebody yanked the hair on your head that hard? And then they beat him. Blow after blow after blow. And then if that wasn't bad enough, they took a crown of thorns and twisted them together with the thorns still sticking out and shoved it on his head. And then what they would do, the way that crucifixion would work is that Jesus carried that heavy cross beam because traditionally what they would do is that the pole would already be in the ground. The cross is, the, is what you would carry. But the body made the silhouette of a cross being tied and nailed to the beam. And, and, and they took him and they stretched him out and they took these big rusty nails they didn't even go down to Home Depot and get some good ones. They took these big rusty nails and nailed it through his hand. How much pain would you be in if somebody took nails this size and just shoved them with force through your hand? Because he's 100% man, even though he's 100% God, he felt that pain just as you and I would feel that pain. Amen? Amen? But that did not cause him to cry out to God. He's been nailed to the crossbeam. His arms are wrapped, tied, so he would stay there. Then when they get you to the spot, they would hoist you up, and there would be a notch in the top of the pole. 
And so when they stretch you out, your body made the silhouette of a cross. And as he hung there, they didn't stop there. They got more nails and nailed his feet to the cross. They wrapped his feet one over the other and drove another nail through his feet. How much pain would you be in? But that still didn't make him cry out to God. He took all of that excruciating whipping, that pain. He's, be he's bleeding profusely as he's hanging there on the cross. But that's why he came. He did that because of his love for me and you. Remember, God told Adam, the day that you eat from the tree, you should surely die. And the day that Adam and Eve ate from the tree, they died spiritually. And eventually physical death came also as a result. And what Jesus going to Calvary did was reverse the curse of the garden. Because somebody had to pay for the sins of humanity. Because God told Adam that. That there would be judgment. But instead of allowing us to pay our own judgment for our sins, Jesus took the penalty himself. He took the penalty of our sin for himself, on himself, for our benefit. To allow us to be in a right relationship with God. He is our perfect atoning sacrifice. No other sacrifices are needed. All we have to do is turn and place our faith in Jesus' hands, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all unrighteousness. Amen. So here he is. He's hanging there in all of that excruciating pain. And the Bible says there's a thief on the left and a thief on the right. And you might say, why did they hang Jesus there with thieves. He was hung there with people who actually deserved what they were getting. Jesus didn't deserve what he was getting. But he hung there for me and for you, as well as the thief on the left and the thief on the right. Amen? Now, you didn't go to the cross because you were just a common thief. You didn't go to the cross because you pickpocketed somebody. You didn't go to the cross because you stole $10. If you went to the cross, it's because you did something so reprehensible that, that the worst way to treat you in death and make sure you humiliated in pain was Calvary, was to nail you to the cross. The Persians invented it, and the Romans perfected it. It was meant to give you agony. And depending on what kind of stamina you had and how much pain you could take, you can hang there all week. You can hang there all week. Just in a lot of pain, it depends on what your threshold was. But eventually, you would die. And what they would do to hasten your death, remember what time it is. They had to get them, uh, Jesus and these other two dudes off from down up there. And the reason why, because the Sabbath was coming. That's why they broke their legs. You say, well, why does, what make, what does that make sense? That just caused them more pain with broken legs. No, because what you did is, as you hung, if you hang like this, what that's going to do to you is all of this is going to get choked up and blocked. And what you would do in order to kind of get some airway, you will push your foot against the board of that cross, the wood of that cross, and you push up. So you couldn't push up, they break your legs. They broke the legs of the thief on the left, and they broke the thief, legs on the thief on the right. But they did not break Jesus' leg because the prophet said they would not. Because by the time they got to him, he had already gave up the ghost. Now, he didn't give up the ghost because he couldn't have stayed longer. It was just time for him to give up the ghost. In other words, it was time for him to die. Amen? And so I'm trying to, get, to give this to you as vividly as I can 
Because so many times when we think about resurrection, we think about Easter bunnies and eggs and candy. And that has nothing to do with this story. At all. And I'm not saying there's nothing to do with Easter eggs or bunny or candy or thing like that. Amen. You got some almond joy on them? I'll take some of them off your hand. I sure will. You got some chocolate with nuts in them? I'll take some of them off your hand. I sure will. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. But remember what the story is all about as, as it relates to Easter. And the word Easter only appears in the King James Version of the Bible because it's, it's, it's the word Pascal. That's that word that's translated Easter. That's where it comes from. From the Greek translation of scripture, from the, actually the King James Version, how it translates. And it just, the word just means Passover. That's what the word means, Passover. Amen? And so, the second point, what evidence does Matthew teach us that proves God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love for us is Jesus allowed himself to be humiliated for our redemption. Now, this is God, incarnate, being mistreated by his own creation, but he takes it. Wow. But he takes it. Look at verse 38. It says, at that time, the two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling their abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. You know where they get that from? Because Jesus talked about destroying the temple, but he wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about his own temple. He said, destroy this temple. He's talking about himself. But they misinterpreted a whole lot of what he said. And they were angry because it took them a long time to build that temple. You know, the temple was destroyed and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt a number of times. And the, the temple that they're referring to, it took 46 years. Could you imagine taking 46 years to build your church? By the time you got it up and going, guess what? A lot of your members gone. <laughs> they, they, they couldn't even see the place. <laughs> 46 years. Misinterpret what he said. They say, if you are the son of God, come down off that cross. If you're all of that, get yourself down. <laughs> That's what they say. If you're all that, untie yourself. Pull them nails out. If you're all of that. You heal other people, why don't you heal yourself? Destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. They missed his point. He was speaking of the temple of his body. He would not come down from the cross, but it was not because he was powerless to do so. You got to understand that. He did not come down because he couldn't. He stayed because of me and you. And all those who returned him for salvation. The proof that he was the son of God came in three days when he returned with the temple. In other words, his body resurrected. Verse 41 says, in the same way the chief priests and all of the scribes and the elders were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. Is he, if he's the king of Israel, let him come down on the cross and then we'll believe in him. You know those are words of Satan that's trying to entice him, right? Because what happens if he comes down? There's no redemption. The plan of salvation is canceled. If he comes down as they, if as they are saying and trying to provoke him to do, he trusts in God. Let him let God rescue him now if he delights in him. Wait a minute. Did they not even read Isaiah? Did they not read Isaiah 53, which they would have had? It pleased the Lord to, bu uh, uh, to abuse him. It pleased the Lord to do what he did to him for our benefit. Let him deliver him, which goes back to Psalm 22. He said, I'm the son of God. The religious leaders assumed that God would not let his son be executed. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now, something had to change. Because Matthew tells us that both of these thieves on the left and right were hurling insults at Jesus. But look in Luke chapter 23, verse 39, it says one of the criminals who, were, who had hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other responded and rebuked him, saying, 
Do you not even fear God since you under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our crimes. But this man has done nothing. And he turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, not tomorrow. He said, today you will be in paradise with me. That thief didn't get, have a chance to get baptized. But he repented hanging on that cross. And Jesus said to him, because of your faith, Today, you'll be with me in paradise. You would think the other thief would have said, yeah, give me what he, he asking for. You think the other one would have said, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Can, can I get some of that salvation stuff too? <laughs> can I get some of that forgiveness too? <laughs> can I get some of that redemption too? <laughs> he didn't. Only one of them. Amen? So again, what evidence does Matthew teach us that proves God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love for us Starting with verse 45 through verse 56 of chapter 27, Jesus dies for the sin of the world. The significance of his death is conveyed through supernatural occurrences. Amen. So the third point is that Jesus was willing to suffer for our sins. To show you how much God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love is for us. Jesus is willing to suffer for our sins. It says, verse 45 said, now from the sixth hour. Darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. All right. Likely represents divine disfavor over the imminent death of the Messiah. The Greek text says that the darkness lasted from the sixth hour to ninth hour. In other words, the first hour of the day was 6 a.m. So the period of darkness was 3 p.m. Amen. So in other words, if you were outside and it's 12 noon, and the sky get dark, what does it tell you? Something's are coming. Because <laughs> generally it's not dark at 12 noon. And this darkness lasted all that time. Now watch this. At about the ninth hour. Wait a minute. This is after he has been beaten. He's bleeding. He's in extraordinary pain. And all of the physical things that he felt did not cause him to cry out to God. He took all of that. But something happened at the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice to our Heavenly Father. He said, Eli, Eli, lama sambachthani. That's Aramaic. And it translates, my God my God, why have thou forsaken me? All right? Here's why that's important. In Aramaic, Eli, when you, when you, this word that's used is Eli, if they think he's calling for Elijah, but what he's quoting is Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Here's what's interesting. The whole time that Jesus walked the earth, how did he address his father in heaven? He always said, my father, my father. Anytime he addressed him, anytime he talked about him. Again, anytime he addressed him directly, he always said, my father. The reason being is that when you have a relationship. Then you can call him father. If you know Jesus as your saving Lord, you can call him my father. You can call him daddy. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. If you do not have a relationship with him or sin is in the way, you cannot call him father. You cannot call him daddy because he is not your daddy. He is not your father because you have no relationship with him. Right. Amen. Right. What change? It was at that very moment that all the weight of the world's sins were poured out on Jesus on Calvary. Every murderer was poured out on Jesus. Every headache, every migraine, every mutilation, every death, every sin was poured out on Jesus at that very moment, which caused him to cry out, my God. He couldn't call him father because the sin of the world was on him. 
He can only say, my God. Because we know by him using that language that the relationship was severed. The relationship was interrupted because of the, my sins and your sins that were poured out on him and on Calvary. You say, well, God never went through what I went through. Stop lying to yourself. Because he did. Every bad thing that's ever happened to you and every bad thing never done done to you and every bad thing you've done, guess what? Jesus paid it all. He felt it. Every lie you ever told, he felt it. Every stab you ever had, he felt it. Every gunshot you ever had, he felt it. That's what he took on himself on Calvary. All of the sins of humanity from the beginning of time to the end of time, he took it on Calvary. That's why he cried out. Because the relationship never before in the history of eternity, past, present, or future, had the Godhead been separated. And the Godhead was separated for my redemption and for your redemption. Amen? If that's not enough to make you go to church, then what will? If that's not enough to make you pray, what will? If that's not enough to make you turn to Jesus and say, God, I need you, what will? What will? If that is not enough about what he did for me and for you. Now, it'd be one thing if you and I were created for time, then we could live our life any way we please. But you and I weren't created for time. You and I were created for eternity. And you and I will spend eternity somewhere where there's only two locations, smoking and non-smoking. That's it. You either go to hell or you go to heaven. There are no other places to spend eternity in because, we, again, we weren't created for time, we were created for eternity. But here's the beauty of it. God don't make that decision for you because of your free will. He allows you to make your own decisions of what you think about him. He makes you, he allows me and you to make our own decision about being in a relationship with him. He don't force you in a relationship. He wants you in a relationship because you want to be in a relationship with him. He'll try to channel you and push you in that direction, kind of like a pinball machine but he won't make you make the decision. He will give you every opportunity to make the decision, but he won't make the decision for you. He'll just give you the choice. He won't make you choose it, but he'll give you the option. Amen? Amen. So about the sixth hour, the ninth hour, the darkness fell. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, Sambachthani, this is my God, my God, why have they forsaken me? And some of those who were standing, verse 47, there when they heard it, began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. In other words, filled it with sour wine to dull the pain or quench the thirst. But the rest of them said, let's see whether or not Elijah We'll come and save him. And why Elijah? Elijah was one of those unique human beings in the Bible who never experienced death. Because the Bible said he was walking with God and God took him. Just took him. He walked along. Remember, Elisha takes over for Elijah. And he picks up his mantle, crosses over the Jordan River, took the, the, the mantle, hit the, and the river departed. Remember, he's the one that saw what Elijah did. He said, he said, boy, you called me in the ministry. That's a heavy lift. He said, but I'll do it if you give me a double portion of that anointing you put on him. Amen. See, you always got Christians talking about giving me a double portion. Y'all just greedy, but they ain't going to use it for his glory. Amen. Amen. You know how people are, they give me a double portion. It'd be one thing if you needed to fuel yourself because you're going to do, do some work. But if you just want a double portion so you can sit around and watch TV and be lazy, that's a whole other story. But if God's going to anoint you like that, then he's going to want his mileage out of you for that. Amen. Because he's just not anointing people just to say they got, they're anointed. Amen. The rest of them said, let's see if Elijah will come and save him. The other one, by the way, was Enoch. For the Bible trivia folks, Enoch, God took him as well. So again, what evidence does Matthew teach us that proves God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love for us? Jesus' death removed the barrier from sinful man approaching the holy God. You ought to shout right there. Amen. Jesus' death removed the barrier. How do we know that? Let's follow the text. 
And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. That means he died. That means his spirit left the, the physical body. And it gave up the spirit as an idiom, meaning dead. And behold, the, uh, the second thing that happened supernaturally is the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The curtain in the temple was torn, symbolizing unrestricted access to God, the Father, by placing our faith in God, the Son, Jesus Christ. Here's why that's important. Now you have to understand Old Testament terminology. You have to understand the Old Testament tabernacle system. In the Old Testament tabernacle, you have the Holy of Holies and you have the, uh, the, the most holy place. And they, they were divided by a curtain. All right. When you went into the tabernacle and you first walk in uh, to the left, you had three pieces of uh, furniture that was in there in the tabernacle. You had the altar. Uh, you had the, the candle stand, the golden lamp stands. On the left, you had the table of shoe bread with 12 uh, baked loaves of bread had to be there. And no, no mold would get on those bread. They have to be baked daily because they were for the priest. And then you had the curtain that walled off going into the most holy place. And what that what was in there is the Ark of the Covenant. Inside that Ark of the Covenant, uh, you had and Rod that budded. You had the, uh, the t two tablets that contained the Ten Commandments, and you had the jar of manna. And then over that, you had the cherubim, the angels that were carved in that sat on that. That was what was inside there. One, only once a year could the high priest go in there. And that was on the Day of Atonement. And he would offer up sacrifice and atoning for his sins and the sins of everybody else. Inside the other part of the area, the other priests could go in to take care of their daily duties. But only the priest could go inside because you had the pillars and you had the gate. And the only one who could go inside were the priest. And when you and I would go, if we weren't priests, we'd go to the gate and we would give our sacrifice, our animal, to be sacrificed for our, our, for our sins. And they would take the animal and they would walk over to the laver, which is on the other side of the brazen altar, which is where the, the, the animals uh, were put to fire. And they wash and cleanse. It was like a little baptism pool. And then they would put the uh, animal on there and they would cook it. And they would take some of the blood and they would throw the blood on the people. That was an Old Testament system. Remember the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Now, Jesus is the final lamb sacrifice for all the sins of the whole world. All right? And so when it says that when Jesus gave up his spirit and it said in the temple, that big, thick curtain that went from the top to the bottom that separated the Holy of Holies from the most holy place, when it was torn the fact that it was torn from top to bottom signifies God tore it. The fact that it was removed says that you and I have access to the throne of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the significance of Calvary. That's the significance of him shedding his blood because Jesus' blood removed the barrier. Amen. You don't have to go through Mary to intercede for you as Catholics do. Why go to somebody else when you go to the boss? Amen. 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 Why go to the middleman when you go to the boss? Amen. Why don't you go? Why not go to the one who holds the whole world in his hand? Amen. Jesus gave us access to that Amen. by giving our faith in Him, placing our faith in Him and Him alone. Amen. 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 And said so the tombs were open. Verse fifty-two confused a whole lot of people. We're almost done. But this gets good and gooder. The tombs were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now, how long they've been in the grave? Long enough for them to just be bones. But it didn't say bones walked out. It said they walked out with their flesh on them. In other words, they walked out with resurrected bodies. Some of the Old Testament saints, not all of them, some of the Old Testament saints walked out and they even walked into the city. In other words, they would have had the same flesh they, 
the, 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 the way they looked, the only difference was is that they would not have any pain. They wouldn't have blood all over them. They wouldn't have scars. In other words, they walked out with resurrected bodies. Amen? And it says that, and coming out of the tomb after his resurrection, they entered the city and appeared to many. It says, now the centurion, those who were with him and keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened, and he said truly, this was the Son of God. We know it not was, but is. Not past tense, but present tense. Remember, the, the centurion is not a believer. At least not at this point he was. He is going by what he know, what he saw, what he witnessed. He's like, everything I've seen and everything I've heard, he says, surely, <laughs> this was the son of God. And if that convinced a centurion soldier, a Roman soldier, who was responsible for him being dead, then how should that affect the rest of us? Well, you might ask yourself, well, who put him to death? Who put Jesus to death? Was it the Roman soldiers? The Roman government? Who put Jesus to death? Was it the Pharisees and Sadducees? Who put Jesus to death? Or was it me and you? It was the all of the above. All of the above were responsible for Jesus going to Calvary. Amen? And what we have to understand is we, we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday. We have to ask ourselves if we believe that God saved us by going to Calvary, raising from the dead, then what we have to understand is we have to ask ourselves, do I play with that? Do I take that serious? Am I giving God my best when I know that he died for my sins? Because I know he didn't save me so I can act the same way I was before he saved me. He saved me so I can go on a different path. That I would surrender my will for his will. Amen? As I close, and I don't beat anybody up for going on Easter Sunday. I don't. I joined the Air Force in 1985. I was not a believer. I did not used to go to church when I joined. I'm standing. I was, my first job in the military before I became a chaplain, I was a military cop. So I'm standing by the dormitory on base, and it's me and a couple other people, some people I work with as cops. And somebody in that group, and I think some of the other people, uh, young ladies worked inside the, the building that we provide security for. And somebody said, hey, Sunday is Easter. Let's go to church. That resonated with me. You know why? Because when I was growing up, that's the only time we went. Because mom would buy us an Easter outfit or make us an Easter outfit. And I don't know about you, even at that age, I like being sharp. And I would go for Easter. But that was really the only time we went. We might go a few other times than that. I think the church bus would come down our street. Mom put us on and made us go. We never had a church as a family. But something happened to me. Because I know that preacher was talking to me. Because I, would, I started going to church in my adult life by myself, on my own. Nobody made me. And I, as I began to listen to that preacher, and I knew that preacher was talking to me. From the very first moment I heard his sermon to the next sermon, the sermon after that. But I didn't say yes right away. My life began to continue to unravel. And so what I did was I made an appointment to go talk to that chaplain in his office. He was a captain. I was an enlisted person. So he far outranked me. And I went to see that chaplain. I didn't go with the intent of giving my life to Christ, but that's what happened. Because he just shouted to me straight. He let me know that you, you die in the state you're in right now, you're going to hell. But God has so much love for you. He went to Calvary for you. He did all those things on your behalf, but you will never experience his love until you surrender your life to his will. And I bowed my head. He led me in a simple prayer. And my life been on a different trajectory ever since then. I didn't know that I would become a chaplain, become a minister of gospel. I didn't know I'd become a pastor at that point. I just know I had a hunger for God's word. And because I did not know the Bible, 
I still go to Bible study. The church I attended then, they, they had Bible study like three days a week. Some Saturday classes, they had every Wednesday night, they had Sunday school. I went to all of that. And I was the one always asking my questions. And it was shortly thereafter that God called me to ministry. I was not ready for ministry, but he called me. And so to prepare for ministry, he put me around the right people that encouraged me. He had sent me to Bible college, and then I went on to seminary. Why am I sharing that story with you? Because I would be willing to bet that somebody sitting here right now, your life is not where God needs to be. You know it. God knows it. Showing up doesn't fix it. Saying yes to him is what fixes it. Stop going through the motions. Because I know this pandemic this, that we've been going through for over a year has really, really challenged a lot of people's faith. And has caused us out of fear to not even be around the people we love and be the places where we need to be. Amen. Ever since this pandemic, guess where I've been every Sunday? Right here. And the reason why, because my wife and I had to make a decision. How do we continue to minister to agape so agape still exists on the other side of the pandemic? And so out of faith and standing forth in faith, we take all the uh, precautions and things that we have to take, but we have to be right here. When they could only allow 10 in here with us coming and those who have come faithfully to help us to uh, stream the service, I'm grateful and thankful for those families because even when we can only have 10, Reverend Sampson, his family were here. And even when we can only have 10, Reverend Victor would come. He couldn't bring his whole family because it would take us past the 10. My wife and I, we made eight. So after that, we, we hit the 10 real fast. But we thank God that we were able to stream this message as it's being streamed right now. And we got a lot of feedback because this message goes around the world. For my dear friends, our African brothers and sisters in Nigeria, they get this message. I'm, I'm pleased and I'm amazed. My daughter, son-in-law, they watch this message. Even my granddaughter, she get to see Papa on the screen. <laughs> I'm grateful. Other family members live in different parts of the United States. They watch this message. More people watch our service than before the pandemic. What am I trying to tell you? We actually reach more people than we were before. That's the kind of things God does. But at some point, the pandemic is going to come to an end. And you're going to have to ask yourself where you're going to be standing. Or you're going to be so far behind in your walk with God, it's going to take you years to catch up. Or you're going to make a decision today that, Lord, I think I need to take more walks with you. I need to come a little closer to you because I have not been where I need to be because my job, all the situation, every, all the craziness going on. Lord, today, on this Resurrection Sunday, Lord, I will commit to you. I will recommit my life to you. And Lord, I will commit to this church and I will make a difference for your kingdom. However you choose to use me, I will no longer live in fear. And I know where you're speaking to me. I know why I'm learning and I'm growing. And Lord, I want to give you my all because I need you every day. Every day I need you. Because only you can fix what's broken in my life. It's not of the government to fix me. They can't. It's not for my family to fix me. They can't. But Lord, you have all the tools and all the power, all the authority, all healing is in your hands. But you can. God gave us life. As Jesus says, I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Do you experience that abundant life? If not, you need to turn to God and say, God, I want to experience that. It might have been a while. But you decide that, Lord, I'm going to walk with you strong. I'm not going to act like everybody else, living in fear. I will take all the precautions, safety measures that I need to take. If I need to, make, to continue to wear a mask, I'll do that. But I will not live in fear. If they offer me vaccines, I'll do that as well. But, Lord, I just want to walk with you. And I need the encouragement of my brothers and sisters around me to encourage me to continue this journey. Because, God, you didn't cause any of us to walk this journey by ourselves. And, Lord, I'm guilty because I've been a loner. I've been trying to do this by myself. Just my two, my four, no more. But, Lord, today, I heard you. 
I heard you tell me about your amazing, unconditional, undeserving love that you have shown toward me all my life. Even before I knew you, you had preserved me. And you have been watching over me. And you've been challenging me ever since. But Lord, I want to experience you like never before. And today is that day. I don't want to take another day without you. I don't want to take another step without you. If that resonates with you, bow your head with you. And pray this prayer with me just, Lord Jesus, here I am. Lord, this message was for me. I heard you loud and clear, oh God. As good as you have been good to me, Lord, I have not returned the favor. I have not given you my best. I have not given you my all. But today, I don't give you excuses. I give you my apology. Lord, I'm sorry. And I ask that you forgive me, oh God. Help me get back on the right path and the right track today. Help me stop playing like a Christian and actually live like a Christian. Help me to stop playing church and actually be the church. Lord, today, I give you my all in all. I turn everything over to you, oh God. I confess Jesus Christ is my saving Lord. Fill me with the presence of the Holy Spirit that will empower me to walk right, to talk right, to act right, to live right, to do right. From this day forward, I'm all yours. Everything I have and everything I am belongs to you. And I will be faithful to you through and through. And I just ask, oh God, you give me the strength and power of your Holy Spirit to walk with me each day, to teach me each day, to guide me each day, to lead me each day. For my good and your glory, I pray. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. How many of y'all are grateful that Jesus paid it all? And because he paid it all, stop trying to pay it yourself. Because your bill has been paid in full. And all we have to do is live for him all the days of our lives. 
whatever sacrifice he would have us to make. Amen. I am so grateful for each of you. I thank God for all that he does in my life. I thank God for my wonderful wife. Today is our anniversary. I'll admit that I'm not the most easy person to live with or get, get along with, but I'm trying. Thank you, Jesus, that my wife has been hanging around me all these years, and I just thank God for her, and uh, she's still the fruit in my fruit basket. She's still a peach in my cobbler. She's still the cool in my aid. She's still all of that to me and my best friend, and I thank God for her. I thank God for my Agape family. You all inspire me. I just want you to know when I'm sitting in my study and I'm going in God's presence and I say, oh God, what would you have me to tell your people? You all inspire me to preach the Bible the right way. And I thank God for that. Give, give you some news before we close. Uh, some of y'all knew that I wrote a book last year and we're finishing up the beginning part this year. And so that book is entitled are based on a series of sermons that I did last year, did with all the racial unjust. It starts with 16, 19, and it comes all the way forward to give you all the stories, all the passages. And it talks about race relations from a biblical perspective and how the church has failed and what our job and our role is, uh, because it's simply entitled, What's Wrong with America from a Christian Pastor Perspective? And hopefully that that book will be out next month. I thank God just to know how amazing God has been to me. When I joined the Air Force, I had been in about three months and they say, Aaron Powell, you need to go down to the uh, education office and take a test. It was a reading comprehension test because when I took my ASVAB scores, I did not show that I read above a ninth grade level. And so I was not one who could write at that time. I was not one who could actually put two sentences together if I had to write a formal letter. And God used the military because by being a cop, I had to learn how to write reports. And when I first took English composition, when I first went to college when I was 17, uh, I dropped the course because the professor came in and said, well, how much are we going to have to do? I said, I don't know how to do any of that. And I didn't understand the English language like I thought I did, but I didn't. And so I remember after I gave my life to Christ, I went back to college and have been an A student, AB student ever since. All by the grace of God. I took English composition one on one. I did so well. I got an A. I clipped two. That means I just took a test and passed it. That's what God does. And for God to bless me to be able to write doctoral dissertations and books and the lessons and things that you see. What I'm trying to tell you is that your life in God's hands matters. Stop selling yourself short and looking within yourself and looking within your own abilities and look at the supernatural ability of God, what he will do with you, for you, and through you if you just totally surrender to his will. He will use your gifts and your abilities for his glory. Amen? And I thank God for all that he has done in my life. I'm so excited about what he has done and what he has continued to do. Again, you all inspire me. You may see this sermon series that we have been through. God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love toward us. Same passage, same written in book form. So keep praying for me and I keep praying for you. Amen. And so I will autograph each copy for you when it comes. I'm so grateful. Again, you all inspire me. And I just want to inspire you to God be the glory for great things he has done. I need you and you need me. So let's get along as family. Amen. Amen. Let us stand to God be the glory. If you've been blessed by today's message, those of you who've been watching online, we'd invite you to go to agapecommunityfellowship.org. It tells you how you can give and donate to our church. We thank those of you who have been giving faithfully and generously uh, to our friends, from friends around the world, people that we serve with. When my wife and I served in the military, we thank you so much. We thank you so much. And there's a place you can donate. You can do it online. You can actually mail it here. There's a way that you can mail it here to the church. 
But I'm encouraging you to keep on doing what you're doing because it allows us to keep doing what we're doing for the Lord. Amen. There are two funds we encourage you to give toward. Our regular general often that helps us pay everything else around here. But we also have a mission fund. And for our Nigerian families, and uh, we kind of use those resources for mission work. And so as you continue to give toward that, we'll be continue to provide for that ministry. We thank God for each of you. You're not here by accident. You're here today by God's divine purpose. And I hope that God has spoken to your heart. I hope you leave here encouraged. And I hope that you know how much God loves you. No matter if nobody else loves you, know that God loves you with an unconditional love. So don't walk this journey by yourself. God has given you some amazing brothers and sisters in Christ to walk this journey with you and encourage you. Amen? Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Receive your benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May he always make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May nothing you face in life be anything your God cannot handle. May you go forth today under the resurrection power of God, the Holy Spirit that lives within us, that will guide us and lead us along the way. And may he bless us forevermore. Whatever we're lacking, not only did he meet it, but he would exceed it. Lord, give us the strength to handle what you're walking us through each day. Lord, bless us with your very best, what you have in store for us in this new year. And Lord, we pray whatever we're lacking, that you'd bless us, that we may further your kingdom here on this earth is our prayer. And may God watch between me and you until we meet again is our prayer. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Depart to serve.